This is Novel Marketing, the show for novelists who aren't necessarily fond of marketing, but still want to become best-selling authors. Episode 107. I'm James L. Rubart, but of course you can call me Jim. I'm Thomas Umstadt, Jr. And in this episode, we're going to talk about common book cover mistakes. But first, Thomas, just a quick update. Married life going well. You doing? I mean, got to see Margaret at ACFW. That was cool. She seems really happy. Give us the quick, uh, <laughs> quick yeah, update. Yeah, marriage is amazing. I should have gotten married 10 years ago. <laughs> so very, very glad to be married. I'm very thankful to be married to Margaret. So. Okay, so you're recommending it to others. <laughs> Good. I Good. am. Good. We need to bring marriage back, people. Give it a try. Uh, the statistics that you've been told on marriage are actually bogus. <laughs> There's a great book I read called Good News About Marriage, and apparently the vast majority of women are still married to their first husbands and are still happily married. And so this whole like 50% divorce statistic is an urban myth, which makes sense since it's super even and never changes year to year. That's like it has all the characteristics of an urban myth. So oh, that's good. Anyway, I'm very thankful. Well, and have you read this stuff where, where health-wise, it's better for guys? I mean, they have less heart attacks, they have less stress, all this kind of thing being married is actually pretty healthy for you, too. And they live longer, too, yeah. So um, that's not why I got married, but I am uh, thankful for the health benefits of marriage. So there you go. Okay. But, uh, but we're the, not here to talk about exactly, marriage. Exactly, yeah, that's we're right. We're here to talk about book cover mistakes and mistakes that authors make with their book covers, particularly indie authors, but... Traditionally published companies sometimes also make these mistakes. So even if you're traditionally published, you want to know the mistakes so you can hold your publisher accountable. <laughs> exactly. So quick reminder from last episode, if you haven't or if you haven't listened to it yet, your book cover is the most important element of your book marketing and a bad cover can ruin almost all of your other marketing effort efforts. So this is not the place to do a cover quickly. This is not the place where you want to skimp on budget. This is an area of marketing you have to get right. That's right. It really is critical to have a good cover. And very often when people are wondering why is my book not selling uh, and they come and talk to me, I, I have to tell them, well, it's your cover, which is really hard to say because that's often the one thing they can't change. Either their publisher gave them a bad cover or they don't have the budget or they've already printed 5,000 copies with this bad cover. So the, you want to know this. <laughs> the, what we're about to tell you could save you a lot of uh, heartache and money. So let's uh, get to mistake number one. And this is the obligatory uh, mistake number one you'll see on all of the lists, designing it yourself. So designing a book cover is incredibly complex. It is a combination of art, it's a combination of design, and it is a combination of packaging. So like we talked about in last episode, episode 106, your cover in some ways is more similar to a box of Cheerios than it is to the Mona Lisa. Yeah, it's it's it, you know, it's something you can't learn in a week, you can't learn it in a month, you really can't learn it in a year. And back in the the old days of my ad agency when I first started it in 94, I I thought I wanted to be a graphic designer. I wanted to be somebody that did that. And I got fairly good at it, but that's like saying with regard to your book cover, that's like I got fairly good at hitting a baseball, so now I'm going to play in the major leagues. It just won't work. And I will say, I, I've worked with lots of graphic designers uh, over the years, whether through publishing or through uh, websites. And working with a good one is such a different experience than working with an amazing one. Because the amazing ones are able to do much better quick work much faster. And they understand the psychology and the motivations. And it just really makes a difference having a good graphic designer. And if you have a good designer, a lot of these things will fall into place. You see, you don't have to keep quite as close of an eye. Yeah. It. We don't want to belabor the point, but it'd be like you saying, I'm building a home and you telling the electrician, Hey, don't worry about it. I'll wire my home for electricity. Uh, let me, or let me tell you how to do it. No, let the electrician do their job. Let the cover designer do their job. Now, there is something you have to be careful of, and that is um, undermining the designer by making them change a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so uh, you can actually ruin a, a professional design with too much feedback. 
So you, as an author, you're like, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this to the design they've already done. And that actually can make it worse, not better. We did a whole episode on this called um, about design by committee. We'll put a, a link in the show notes. And uh, the reality is, is that the more people you have giving feedback on the book cover, the worse the book cover tends to be. So you have to be very careful um, with the role of creative director, which is what we call this in um agency world, which is somebody who oversees graphic designers. And being a creative director is also a specific skill. And so sometimes there's a lot to be said about just hiring a professional and trusting them to do a good job. Okay, let's move on to mistake number two, which is something that if you're traditionally published, this is not going to be an issue. But I've seen it done on indie covers. And Thomas, I know you've seen it done on indie covers as well. And that is including the word buy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you'd think, oh, this is book title by author name. It makes sense. So it's Rooms by James L. Rubart. That's how I would say it if I was talking to somebody. But you never have the word by on a book cover. You have the title of the book and you have the author name. And they are distinguished graphically using various techniques of typography. And you don't have the word by. Uh, so this is one of the dead giveaways that a book is self-published is if it says... Amazing book by name of the author. <laughs> exactly. Mistake number three is saying both award winning and best selling on your book cover. You can say one, you can say the other, but on your book cover, you're not going to say both. So you need to pick one. Now, best selling is usually going to be better depending on the level of your bestseller status. That's going to make more impact on people. And the other thing I wanted to talk about here, Thomas, is if the award is not widely known, it's not going to make any impact on people. So unless your award is something that is basically known throughout the country or throughout the world, the award is going to be subservient to the title of best-selling author. That's right. In almost every instance, best-selling is better than award, with a couple of exceptions. So if you've won a Nobel Prize for literature, if you've run a Pulitzer Prize, or maybe one or two others that are like, oh my goodness, then it's, you know I care more about a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer Prize for a book than the fact that it's a bestseller. That's even more special. It's even more rare. But in general, once you hit bestseller status, just put the word bestseller. You don't have to specify what kind of bestseller. Uh, so a lot of you know bestsellers in the Christian space are bestsellers on the Christian book list, and so that they're not a New York Times bestseller; they're just a best-selling author, which means it's some other list that they hit uh, the bestseller status on. Um, I don't th- consider Amazon bestseller for a day because of a book bub. I don't consider that best-selling. Uh, some uh, authors will put that on their book, and I feel like that's cheating. Uh, and it, when readers find out about it, they don't feel like it's real. It needs to be a non-Amazon list for bestseller status. That's a really good point, Thomas, and, and people do it. I was the best-selling uh, author on Amazon from 2 to 3 in the morning on September 15th. That really does not count. It needs to be an established, legitimate best-selling list, so be careful of that. All right, mistake number four is forgetting to add the shelving instructions above the ISBN barcode. So we talked a lot about shelving instructions in uh, episode 106, but this is the genre, so fiction, urban fantasy, or fantasy, urban fantasy above the barcode. And if you're independently published, you're often not thinking about bookshelves. This is a very easy mistake to make. But when you make this, people, it just, something looks missing. It doesn't feel professional when they look at the back of your book. Yep, exactly. All right, mistake number five is when the imagery is too on the nose. (laughs) So oftentimes we can tell when an author's been very involved in their book cover because it's almost like the cover is too specific to their story. Um, Too on the nose where it... or. it, it's, oh, this is a little hard to describe, but it, your book cover needs to tease. And um, to use a swimsuit analogy, you need to be wearing some kind of swimsuit. You don't just go to the beach wearing nothing. And sometimes that's what the book cover is. It gives away all of the secrets of the book. There's no mystery. There's no nuance. There's no um, seduction. 
And you need to seduce your readers with your book cover by giving them some, but not giving them everything of what your book is about. And there need to be surprises. There needs to, you know, you can't spoil your book with your book cover. You know, like uh, there's right now the Star Wars trailer just came out for episode eight. And there's a lot of debate as to whether or not people should see it or not. In fact, the director even came out and said, you may not want to see this trailer. There are spoilers in the trailer. If you know for sure you're going to watch the movie, don't watch the trailer. And I know people who are, they already know they're going to watch the movie. And so they're purposefully not watching the trailer because they don't want to spoil the movie. And I'm like, why did they make a trailer that gave away parts of the movie? You know, they, Disney is doing their own thing and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to criticize them until I know if it worked or not. But you need to be careful and cognizant of that, that um, you can't have it too on the nose. And another way that this is done, and there's a great uh, TED Talk on this that we'll link to in the um, show notes uh, under novelmarketing.com slash 107. It's specifically on book design. So there's a TED Talk on book design by one of the top book cover designers in the world. Um, he did the Jurassic Park cover and a lot of very other iconic covers. And he says, either show an apple or sh- show the word apple but don't do both. (laughs) So um, Jim's book Rooms, the cover picture is not of a room (laughs) because that would break this rule. You can't do to, you can't, you know, beat, you you can't condescend to your readers. Uh, You can't kind of bludgeon them over the head with the premise of your book in the book cover. And when your imagery is too on the nose, um, this uh, is what will happen. To use another analogy, it's like Hansel and Gretel, right? They didn't drop all the breadcrumbs in a pile. They spread the breadcrumbs out along the way. Well, that's the same thing you're doing with your book cover. The first breadcrumb is that cover. The second breadcrumb is that back cover copy. The third book breadcrumb is when they read that opening line. You are drawing these people slowly in because of the mystery. People want to be... They, they want to be intrigued. They want to wonder. They want to, their curiosity to be aroused. And that's what you're doing with your book cover. Or that's what you, you want to do with your book cover. All right. Mistake number six is to have too many design elements. Uh, these are... So you have there's two elements you have to have for sure on the cover, on the front cover, and that is the title of the book and the author of the book. And you can have nothing other than that, just those elements with a good typographical treatment, you know, good use of fonts. And there are New York Times bestselling books that that's all it is. A title and an author over color, like a super simple. Um now, I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but that can work. What often happens with indie books is that there's like a dozen different things to look at. Uh, or every character in the book is represented on the cover of the book. And it's just, it's very busy. It doesn't reduce well. So when the cover is small, the everything gets lost and it just becomes very noisy. And it doesn't catch my attention. It's not a very effective uh, cover when you have too many design elements. Um, I've written over a thousand TV ads and radio ads, and I would run into this all the time with clients where they wanted to get all these things into 30 second, a 30 second spot. And the analogy I always used with them, as I said, these Indian mystics who lay on a thousand nails, no, I'm laying on 1500 nails and we're supposed to be impressed by that. And I'd always say, I want to see the Indian mystic man lay on one nail. (laughs) <laughs> that would be impressive to me. And well, it's the same thing with your cover design. Yeah, you can put all the nails in there and just stuff it all in, but it will not make the impact if there's just one nail on that cover. Or one visual element other than the co- the title and the author. So these are um, rules, um, kind of general guidelines on covers. A good designer will know when to break these rules, but it, to know when to break the rules, you have to have mastered the rules, which typically means college, like studying you know, design in college or having that level of, of education. And most book covers, most of the time that are successful, follow the rules. And so if you don't you know, you want to go to college or or if you're not working with somebody who studied this in college, just follow the rules. It's a very easy way. And one way to do that is to just keep that number of elements uh, as low as possible. Mistake number seven is being too clever. In other words, if if I can't figure out your book cover immediately, you've lost my attention. I did an ad years ago for um, an asthma uh, client and they had this fundraiser going on and I created this 
unbelievably creative uh, image of this feather and light as a feather and air and all this stuff. And it was brilliant. It, it really was. And then I gave it to the client. They go, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm the client. And that was a wake up call to say, yes, there is room for being clever, but there's room for being. Uh, but the problem is sometimes we get too clever so that people cannot tell what the book is about at all. During the book cover design process, you're spending minutes, sometimes hours, with the book cover, looking over every element and really getting to know it well. Your readers, your potential readers, will be sent spending fractions of a second. So if you're clever, if your cover's trying to say too many things, and this goes along with too many design elements often. So the cleverer it is, the more design elements it tends to have, although these are separate in the sense that it can be clever with just one, too clever with just one element. Um, but the, the simpler you keep it, in, the easier it is to understand, the, the um, more effective it will be. And a good rule of thumb here with both of these is that the simpler the cover design is, the more confident the publisher is in the writing. Um, this is with traditionally published books. If, if it's a very simple cover, often it's an indication that the publisher is very confident in the quality of the writing. It's not a universal rule, but it is a correlation that I've noticed. All right, Thomas, let's talk about typography, because this is a big issue. And this is something that you actually pointed out to me that I did not know, because I'm a little bit older than you. But talk to us about using script fonts. That's right. So there's font. So you're, everyone is familiar with fonts now. Well, 30 years ago, fonts were something that only designers studied in college. But then Microsoft Word came out. You have this drop down. You can pick all these different fonts. And so now people are familiar with at least the basics of kind of rudimentally of, of fonts. And um, but there is a whole world of fonts. Once I, so I worked at an agency. We had a bunch of graphic designers. They would spend entire semesters just studying fonts and the history of fonts and emotionally how different fonts like communicate different things and like psychologically how you can poke different buttons with fonts. It was super fascinating, and um, and so picking good fonts on a book cover is critical especially if you're going with this more simple approach that we're advocating, the font and the topography have to really carry the the way. And now one temptation is, it, and I only see this in tradi independently published books. Traditionally published books have moved away from this altogether, but script fonts will kill your book, uh, especially for younger um, people. So script fonts are things in a cursive-like script. And here's the reality. Young people don't learn cursive anymore. I did not really learn cursive, and I'm 31 years old. Somebody who's younger than me, they took typing in school. They did not take cursive. For me, yeah. when somebody writes me a note in cursive, I, I have to translate it as if from another language, where I'm taking each word and I'm like writing it out and translating it because I can't read cursive just on at a glance. And so if you're book cover and you're like, oh, it's a romance book. They're writing love notes to each other. It's for, oh, you know, it's so soft and kind and blah, blah, blah. No, young people can't read that. <laughs> <They> can't. <Yeah. laughs> and and you're, you're losing the potential audience. And old people often don't read a lot of cursive either. They did when they were younger. But most people, most of the time, are reading typed text. And if you want your cover to work as a one-inch thought thumbnail on somebody's phone if they're trying to decide whether or not to buy it, that tiny cursive text, even if they could read cursive, often disappears because it's not strong enough. And so this is one of those areas where you can get into a lot of trouble. And it's a very common mistake, especially for romance writers, because every romance writer wants script, you know, some sort of script font on their cover. Uh, very Because it's know, pretty. It is. It's elegant. It's pretty. But they, they <laughs> people still have to be able to read it. <laughs> That's right. There are other ways. You can still communicate that handwritten feel. You can still communicate that romantic feel through other fonts. And if you have a designer who's very familiar with typography, um, they'll be able to... Um, you know, help you with this. So one way to find this out is to, you know, ask them, you know, what are some of your favorite fonts? What are some of your least favorite fonts? And what you want to hear when you ask their least favorite fonts are two fonts. There are two no-no fonts that are never to be used under any circumstance. And professional designers make fun of people who use these fonts. So this is one way to tell if they're a professional designer is how much they hate these fonts. And that is Comic Sans and Papyrus. <laughs> So those are the two fonts that are like the big no-no fonts, Comic Sans and Papyrus. Comic Sans has a hysterical like origin of where it came from. 
uh, it it's it was actually if I'm remembering the story correctly, it was created for Clippy, the little um, paper clip cartoon character that was in Microsoft oh, Word is that 2000. Where it came from? Yes. And they needed a font for his little text bubbles that looked like a comic book. And so they they put the font there for him to use it and then they just added it by accident or like, well, we might as well get put it on the list of options for for people writing and like suddenly that's all anyone could use. Like it became like the world's most popular font and it just it's very overdone. It doesn't mean anything uh, and it's a, a font to avoid. Okay, okay, Papyrus, I don't know if you know this, Thomas. I saw this just the other night, but Ryan Gosling, this was on Saturday Night Live, did a hilarious send-up of the Papyrus font as it was used in Avatar, James Cameron's movie. So you can easily Google that, or we'll probably put that in the show notes. Just hilarious. You check that out. Ryan Gosling, where he they send up the Papyrus font. Yeah, so it, it don't you don't want a Saturday Night Live uh, film made making fun of you <laughs> so <laughs> made about your your book but, cover no. that's right mistake number nine is overusing stock photos um so sometimes somebody is tempted to use more than one stock photo in a cover and again this goes back to too clever too many design elements you need to know what the core essence of your book is uh, for it to work and um this is one of those things the use of stock photos in general traditional publishers are often moving away from stock photos. If you look at the New York Times bestselling list, maybe only half of those books have any sort of photo. A lot of them are going to have typographical-only treatment. Um, And of the ones who do have photos, often in the nonfiction area, very often it's a photo of the author because it's some sort of celebrity author and that they're wanting their photo on the cover. If you want to make your book look more... um, you know, have more authority. One easy way to do that is just have your own photo on the cover, even if you're not a celebrity, just because that's what the celebrities do. And people associate that as like, oh, this is the author. They must know what they're talking about. Um, but um, be the temptation is, oh, just grab a stock photo, throw it on, grab some text, and then you're done. Stock photos are not always the answer. For some genres, they're more likely than others, but be careful with using stock photos at all. And if you do use stock photos, be very careful not to use more than one. And what can happen sometimes, Thomas, is, is this was happening uh, called my, a couple of years ago, really called to my attention. And this is not just with indie authors. This was happening with traditionally published authors where they'd go, wait, wait oh my gosh, it's the same cover. It's the same stock photo used or three or four or five different novels. And they'd have, of course, different author name and they'd tweak it slightly. But if you want to be entertained, go and, and, and Google that subject and you'll see all these covers where it's the exact same stock photo. And that can become a little embarrassing. Now, you can check for this ahead of time. If you do a reverse image search on Google, you upload the photo and Google will look uh, on the internet for that photo, you can see other book covers that are using that cover, so you can catch yourself. But most authors don't know how to do reverse image searches. They're not checking this. Um, now, there are ways of buying a stock photo where you buy it and no one else is allowed to buy it, so it's more reserved for you. Um, what big houses will do is they actually will stage their own shoots um, where they will make their own photos. They'll hire photographers and actors, and they'll pose and create settings. Um, and that often is the... You know, if you have the money, that's a good way to go, but that's very expensive. So the key, if you, I'm not saying don't use stock photos. I use stock photos on my book. I've got one stock photo on the front cover, and then I have a different stock photo on the back cover. The primary reason why I have a second stock photo on the back, and and when I say we just one, you know, it's one per, you know, face of the book. It's to tie in with the blog post that my book was based on. So the blog post was read by a million people, and I wanted to kind of remind people of that blog post subtly on the back of the book. Um, so yeah, be careful about, uh, overusing stock photos. The next mistake, we talked about this a little bit already, but it is design by committee. Committee. Um, <laughs> so there was, uh, one of the dollar coins, I think it was a Susan, uh, it was the one after, I think it was, a, I forget which one. There was one dollar coin that was a total disaster. No one used it. And I don't think it was a Susan B. Anthony one. I think it was the one after that. Maybe, um, but uh, it, anyway, it was the one coin that was designed by a committee instead of by a designer. And it was just so much worse than all the other dollar coins that like they have warehouses of them because no one wants this coin. Uh, and we did a whole episode on this, episode 19. Um, you're tempted to get feedback. This is a scary decision. 
uh, you don't want to make a mistake on the book cover. I get that. We kind of have been scaring you with this episode about talking about how important it is. But one thing that people often do out of that fear is they get lots and lots of feedback on the cover from lots of different people. And the problem is, is that you then don't know how to interpret that feedback because people often, they intuitively either like or don't like something and they often don't know why they like or dislike something. And so they're giving you reasons or things that they don't like about it. And those reasons that they're telling you are made up reasons that they've rationally come up with after the fact, after they've come to an intuitive decision. And if you then make a rational change based off of their intuitive decision, you can actually go in completely the wrong direction. And this is why creative direction is kind of a tricky thing to do um, and why getting community feedback is hard. So an easier way to do this, we talked about this in the last episode, is to just run Facebook ads and test with science which ones people click on. So you're not asking them to give you feedback on changes. You are... Um, just seeing which ones get clicked on. And I will say, as you get feedback on your book cover, you don't want to listen for what they're telling you to do. Like, oh, you need to make this font bigger. Uh, That's a mistake. Instead, what you need to do is listen for the problem that they're describing. And the problem is, and you may have to ask some questions, like, why do you think this font is bigger? It's like, well, it's hard to read. Aha, that is a problem. So now you take that problem to your graphic designer and say, I'm getting some feedback that the title is hard to read. Well, the designer has half a dozen different ways of making that font easier to read. They can change the kerning. They can change the letting. They can change the weight of the font. They can change the colors of the background. They can change the contrast. Or they can change the size. And when you say to the designer, oh, you have to use just this one solution, often when you don't even know what the other solutions are, you're suddenly reducing their ability to make your cover amazing. And so when you get feedback, listen for the problem, communicate the problem to the designer, and let the designer solve the problem. Because ultimately, that's what design is. It's designing problem or solving problems. Uh, It's not just making things pretty. That's what artists do. Artists make things pretty, designers solve problems. And that problem may be, I need more book sales. (laughs) My book's not selling. (laughs) My book is not selling. Exactly. So mistake number 11 is using your own artwork. And the reason that this comes into play is most indie authors and most traditionally published authors are creative types. So they not only have the ability to write, but they probably, a lot of them play an instrument or a lot of us also work in painting or art or photography. And so we love to play in these arenas, particularly photography. So we might take a photo and we go, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing photo ever. Oh, I got to use this photo on the book cover. But the problem is we just don't have great perspective on our own art or our own photos. And this is years ago when I walked into this art gallery and I said, boy, you don't have, you know, any photographs uh, for sale here. Why don't you sell photographs? And she said, "Are are you a photographer? I said, yeah, I'm an amateur photographer. I've got some amazing shots. And she goes, yeah, everybody thinks that. <laughs> Therefore, you're not going to come in and buy a photo because you think yours are just as good, even if they're not. So we just have a skewed perspective, and that's okay. But when you're tempted to use your own artwork, be it a painting or be it a photo, please try to resist that. We just, I, I, that was my wake up to call. You don't wake up call to realize, Jim, you don't have the right perspective on your own art. And I'm saying that's probably the case with you as well. Uh, there's a good example of this in the first Lord of the Rings film. Uh, they go to the top of this hill called Weathertop, and it's got all of these old statues that have been weathered and beaten down. And I remember watching the special features for that film, and they were talking about how they had to make these statues. And then they had to, and they were new and perfect, and they had to get different artists to then age them. Mm. Because you, they couldn't have the people who sculpted this beautiful statue then deface it because they were too close to it. It was emotionally too difficult and they would keep it looking too good or it wouldn't look weathered because the, the weather doesn't care <laughs> about you know your beautiful job, right? The wind is blowing and it's tearing it away. And when you take a, you know, a photograph or a stock photo and you put it into a book cover, you have to change it. Right. You have to kind of butcher it. You may be subtracting elements out of that color. You're color shifting it or, you know, in all of that, like cutting it up, you are too emotionally close to that photo. (laughs) You're going to be like, no, the photo is perfect. Use it as it is. And often when they do this and you can tell when graphic designers have authors that force them to do this, they'll often just put the photo in a frame. 
because they can't do anything with the photo because the author is too emotionally close to it. And so it's a cover of a picture frame with a photograph inside of it. And I'll tell you, that is not a, a um, cover that's going to be particularly effective most of the time. And it's a very common cover that you'll see. Yeah. Um, just I want to address something real quick because a, a lot of people are, are familiar with the story that on my first book, Rooms, that picture that's on the cover of the book, I actually took that photo. And how that came about is my publisher was saying, hey, give us a feel for what Cannon Beach is like, the Oregon coast. Give us a feel for that. So I just sent that in as, as trying to describe because the house that I took the photo of is exactly where the house is described in Rooms. I had no idea that they were actually going to use it in the book, and they did exactly what Thomas is talking about. They doctored that thing up and made changes and contrast and all these things. So the photo that you see on the book cover is my photo, but it's very vastly different from the actual photo that I took. So allow them to do that. So, and with all of these, these are guidelines, not rules. So you will find, you may be tempted to be like, oh, well, I know such and such successful book who broke this rule. And that's true. None of these are, um, you know, terrible mistakes in the fact that you can't break them. But the key with design and breaking rules in design is that you do it on purpose. You understand what the rule is. You understand why you're breaking the rule and why it's okay for you to break the rule in this specific instance. And that takes expertise. Jim didn't have that expertise to do that with his own photo on his own cover. He, they did use his own photo, but they then broke, you know, other, they broke the rule, but they were able to do it because they knew what they were doing. And it's kind of like, it, it's illegal for you to cut someone open. Right? If you take a knife and cut somebody open, that is illegal. You will go to jail unless you are a surgeon. Suddenly, <laughs> the rules of don't, you're not allowed to cut other people with knives, which is a very established law. And everyone is like, yes, that is a good law. That rule does not apply to people who put on white lab coats and go to school. In fact, not only is it permissible for them to cut people open with knives, but they get paid thousands of dollars to cut <laughs> people open with knives. They know when to break the rules. And, and so this kind of goes bring it all back. This is the benefit of having true professionals is that they know when they can follow the rules and when they can break the rules. This episode of the Novel Marketing Podcast has been brought to you by My Book Table. This is a very simple sell. It's free. You need it. All you do is go to mybooktable.com. You download it. You put it on your website. It is the right thing to do. Thomas, any comments on that? It helps you create book pages, uh, and you can. I was actually just working with an author earlier today, and she was writing in several different genres, and she was using my book table, and she was able to have a uh, you know page for her nonfiction. It listed all of her fiction books. You could click on them; it takes them to a whole page for that book, and then a different page that lists all of her you know historical fiction or her nonfiction. Each each category, she's got a page that lists all of her books in that category, and then an individual page for each book, and it makes it very easy to do this. You can do it. Every Everything you do with my book table, you can do by hand. It just takes dozens of hours. And with my book table, it takes dozens of minutes. So if you want to save hours and hours of work on your website while also making your website really effective, go to mybooktable.com and add it to your WordPress website. You've been listening to the Novel Marketing Podcast with Thomas Umstead Jr. and James L. Rubart, giving you novel marketing ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing online, offline, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening.